Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Lowell. I'm a psychologist and also an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics with the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Today, I really wanted to talk about the intersection of clinical practice and of research. And since I'm a psychologist, logically, the intersection of psychology and research in this clinical setting. And we often refer to that as the scientist practitioner model. So I, my main goal is just to show you how someone who is a clinician like myself needs a firm foundation in research in order to inform our clinical practice. So just a little bit about me. I am a proud Maryland Terrapin. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Maryland, and then I came to South Carolina and attended uh, the University of South Carolina to earn my PhD in school psychology. Um, I now, as I said previously, work for the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. We have joined forces with Prisma Health Children's Hospital, well, all of Prisma Health, but Prisma Health. Um, and so I'm technically employed by USC School of Medicine, but also um, do clinical services for Prisma Health. I'm also the Associate Training Director for the South Carolina LEND program, which I'll talk more about a little bit in a moment. So I think before I can really give you an overview of the way that my clinical practice intersects with research, it's important to just tell you a little bit about my clinical practice. So I work for child development and behavioral health. Um, on the top there, you can see our office building. And then on the bottom, um, that is my office and my colleague who I share an office with. Um, and so at our clinic, we have an interdisciplinary team. So we have a psychiatrist. Um, um, we have two developmental pediatricians, we have a general pediatrician, we have a social worker, and we have four psychologists. Um, and we work together as an interdisciplinary team to provide services for children ages 0 to 21 with some sort of a developmental concern. So children are referred to our office for all sorts of different developmental concerns. Um, my primary role is autism assessment, but our clinic also does learning disability assessment, um, ADHD, developmental delay, intellectual disability, some of those um, more rare genetic conditions, really anything that is a ch affecting a child's development or behavior in that early developmental period. Um, so our office offers three primary services. We offer consultation. So basically that's kind of, I always phrase it as, where are you now? What are your concerns and what do you need? So, um, you know, what, what's already been done? What kind of diagnoses does your child already have? What assessments been done? What questions do you have? What problems are you having? Let's kind of just work together to really collaboratively design a really good plan for your child moving forward. And so that's the consultation piece. Often the consultation piece leads to an assessment piece. So especially if a child has never been assessed before, or perhaps they've been assessed um, for one thing, but there's concerns about something else going on, then we would complete that assessment um, through our office. And then the last piece that I do not offer as a psychologist, but that our clinical offers, clinic offers is medication management. So um, our, our physicians, if the child needs medication for ADHD or for anxiety or for super aggressive behavior, um, our providers will prescribe those medications and manage them. Our office uh, does not at this time provide any therapy or any other direct intervention, which I think a lot of people think psychologists, how, how are you a psychologist and you don't offer therapy? Um, but I'm, I call myself a testing psychologist or an assessment psychologist, so I'm much more on this assessment and consultation end than I am on a treatment end. Um, so that's a little bit about our office. I also wanted to tell you about my other primary role, which is, um, like I mentioned before, the Associate Training Director for the Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program, or we term that the LEND program. So LEND is um, federally funded through the Maternal Child Health Bureau, and its aim is to grow leaders in the field of neurodevelopmental disability. Um, it is a nationwide program and there are there's at least one LEND program in every state. The South Carolina LEND program is a uh, collaboration between Prisma Upstate, um, U USC School of Medicine, and then MUSC. So it's a graduate level interdisciplinary training program and we pull from all sorts of different disciplines. So we have psychology, but we also have medicine and social work and nutrition and law and 
uh, PT and OT and speech therapists and um, goodness, there's probably a bunch more recreational providers and nursing, um, dentistry. We, we really pull epidemiology, public health. We really try to pull people together from a bunch of different programs so that we can all learn from each other um, because because people don't exist in these silos, right? We, we need to come out of our silos and really train together so that we can pull from each other's strengths and knowledge bases to provide the best service for individuals with disability. Um, our program includes 300 hours over the course of one year. Um, it offers an online course for both the fall and spring semester. Um, our students also have to do a leadership or a research project, which we're going to talk more about that because that's really one of the ways that my job dovetails with research. Um, and then they also participate in clinical visits so they can go out and see a speech therapy appointment or a, a developmental pediatrics appointment or an autism assessment or go see a feeding therapy session or something like that. So they, they our trainees do five clinical visits. And then they also get out in the community and, and go to board meetings of like local nonprofits that serve people with disabilities or a consumer advocacy group that has people with disabilities in that group. So um, it's really a a wide training program um, that that kind of parallels what these students are getting in their graduate level training. It is something that um, is open to anybody in the state. So if any of you listening are aiming to go into a graduate level program and in the future, or if you're in one now, and you're interested in participating as a LEND trainee, um, you can find more information online or I'm happy to talk with you more about that. But um, it is an application process and you can be accepted to participate in this program. It's, it's in, I know I'm biased, but it's very cool. Okay, so enough about that. Um, let's kind of talk about this idea of how research dovetails into clinical practice. So there's a concept called the scientist practitioner model. And I think that this largely applies to psychology, although I, I think that it can be I think that it could be more widely applied across different disciplines, but the idea is that even psychologists who primarily work in a clinical setting like myself must have that strong foundation research and scientific practice. And a lot of people, I know when I first entered grad school, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the research because I have to, but I really just want to be a clinician. Um, kind of going through a scientist practitioner pro um, program has really changed my views quite significantly on that. Um, and even though I don't, I don't conduct research really as like a primary aspect of my job, I just fully appreciate how important it is to understand research um, because it informs everything that we do. Um, and, and that really is, I chose this um, image of a keystone, which I'm from the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, but also because I think that this really shows like, hey, Applied people are the people who are out there doing this work, but the researchers are the one who who are like figuring out what works. So we have to inform each other like the researchers have to help the clinicians figure out how to provide these best interventions or, or you know, what what does cause autism or what does that look like? Um, and then the psychologists have to inform the researchers about, OK, well, these are the questions that we need answers to. And this is how it works kind of in the real world. And this is what our families need or are struggling with. And how can we investigate these things through research to improve our practice? Um, so we're just constantly informing each other. And, and I think that this integration of science and, and practice is really that keystone that that completes our bridge. Okay, so how how does the research really come into play in my daily work when I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not publishing. That's not really a part of my role. Um, this is, you know, conducting a research study or a research lab is not part of my job. But but the uh, importance of research in my job cannot really be understated. So. I um, think that one of the biggest ways that research impacts my job is through what we call evidence-based practice. So evidence-based practice is when, okay, I have, I have my clinical expertise, I may be an expert in autism assessment, um, but then what is this external scientific evidence telling me? You know, because the field of autism is not static. We, it's changing all the time, we're learning all the time. So how can we incorporate that external scientific evidence to really inform our practice, to improve our assessment measures to improve
improve our assessment protocols, to improve our interventions? Um, what, what does that look like? Um, and then really another piece of this triangle is that client perspective, because it has to be evidence-based practice, good practice, has to be informed by the research, has to make sense from a clinical perspective, but it also has to make sense from the client perspective. Um, so when we put all three of those things together, we get this evidence-based practice. So let's talk a little bit more about how that plays out with assessment, intervention, and consultation. So for assessment, sometimes I think of each assessment as like a little mini research project. So when a child comes to me, and I've never met the child before, I've never met the family before, um, the first thing that we have to do is to develop some research questions or some hypotheses about what could be going on. So let's start by collecting some data. Let's figure out, okay, a parent, you know, let's do a parent interview and figure out what is the parent worried about? What are their concerns? What are the symptoms that they are seeing? And then we start to fine tune those hypotheses. Well, could this be autism? Could this be a developmental delay? Could this be ADHD? Is it more than one of those things? Is it something else? And then after we kind of generate all these hypotheses from our initial data, then that helps us further plan. Okay, now we need additional assessment. We need to collect more data to, to try to um, see which of these hypotheses we can rule out. Um, and then after we get all this data together, we're really coming up with our conclusions um, and then making recommendations for further study, <laughs> further recommendations for that child. So it, it's not research in the sense that it is applied, but that same sort of research method of, of developing hypotheses and collecting data and interpreting that data and then having discussion really still applies almost on a miniature scale for each child that I see for assessment. Um, from an intervention standpoint, um, the evidence-based practice is just so critical when we're recommending interventions and treatments and services. Families are desperate often to try to find something that will work, something that will help their child. And a lot of times they're willing to try anything. We don't want to have them do things that don't work. We don't want to have them invest their valuable time and energy and effort and money into something that is, is not effective. So that is one way in which the research is just critical, the external scientific evidence is just critical for me because I'm constantly trying to stay up to date on this literature and what's effective is um, ABA, applied behavior analysis, is, you know, is that the most effective treatment? Does that work for these different age groups? Does that work for kids with different cognitive levels? Does that work for kids who are old, you know, who are older, who may, um, not have been the original target group for that type of therapy. So um, we're really using that research literature to help us inform what sorts of interventions and treatments and therapies should we recommend to this family, and also what do we not recommend. Um, and then the last area is that consultation piece. So from a consultation standpoint, it's like, well, how does research play into that? Well, there's a lot of research out there that tells us how to deliver information and ideas. So when we talk with a family, what kinds of, how, how we deliver that information matters and how can we deliver that information to the family in a way that helps them understand and in a way that helps them then take that information and follow through with our recommendations. And there's actually a lot of really surprising surprising research out there about this. So um, one of one study I found was talking about like the average provider gives eight recommendations and the average family follows through on one. And it was like, wow, that's, you know, okay, well, knowing that, how can we just our, adjust our practice? Um, you know, if we're, if we're giving, maybe we're giving too many recommendations, maybe we need to have follow up, maybe we need to provide this information in a different manner. Um, and that turns us back to the literature to see, okay, well, how how can we deliver information in a way that is actually helpful and meaningful and, and create sustained change? Um, same thing with report writing. So after each assessment that we do, we, we write a report um, and that report goes out to the referring physician as well as to the family. Um, and so there's there's a lot of literature out there about, well, how do you write effective reports and what, you know, what kind of small changes even can we make to those reports to make them more meaningful um, and, and helpful to the family and to the other clinicians who might be reading them in the future. So that's evidence-based practice. I think that that's probably the biggest way that that research comes into my clinical practice, but I do have a number of other ways um, that I participate in research or a 
use research in my practice. So one of the things next is this like critical review of a new idea. So um, you have to know what the literature says about that. So like what happens if a parent comes in and I'm I'm going to give you some real examples here and says, OK, I know my child has autism and um, I have a friend who does um, equine therapy. And I really want to know what is the litter or like, do you recommend equine therapy for my child? Well, uh, equine therapy is horse therapy. Um, sorry if you're not familiar with that. Um, so a parent proposes this idea, well, I've got to go and do a literature review and look at that carefully because that's not a standard treatment that we typically recommend for autism. Um, it's, it's definitely not something that, you know, would be in my top recommendations for a family. But if this is a family who really wants to know, will this help my child? Okay, well, I have an obligation then to help them figure that out. So I might go back and do, the, do a literature review, really think critically about, okay, well, what are this child's needs and how could equine therapy help? Like, you know, if, if the child's needs are primarily social, I'm not sure if that's gonna help or not because you're not gonna be interacting with another child necessarily. Um, but if the child has really weak core strength, well, perhaps equine therapy would be a really good intervention for that child because certainly a riding on a horse um, would, would work the child's core in a way that uh, might be engaging or fun for them. So you have to kind of know what the literature says or be able to do a literature search because we can't know everything um, and then think critically about how to apply that research to the particular child and then come back and make a recommendation to the family. Um, so I think that that just being able to evaluate ideas and it doesn't necessarily have to be ideas that a parent proposes. It could be your colleague wants to um, implement a new program and you're like, wow, that sounds really cool. What does the literature say about that? And how can we do a literature search to really understand um, whether or not that new program would be of benefit? Okay, next um, we have this program evaluation piece and I just say data, data, data. Um, so, so far we've talked about like, okay, how can we use the existing literature to help us provide um, insight into what uh, intervention might be helpful. Um, after that stage, so let's say we've decided that, um, that ABA therapy, applied behavior analysis, would be a really helpful intervention in working on toilet training. Well, after that, we're going to have to start to collect some data to see like, okay, is our intervention working? Now, I don't actually offer the intervention, but sometimes assist with the data collection so that we can kind of see, okay, so we think that um, ABA is going to assist with toilet training. Right now, the child is not using the toilet at all um, and is completely dependent on diapers. So we're going to implement this um, toilet training intervention through ABA. So then we could set up a data collection program to say, okay, is this working? You know, how many times has the child successfully used the toilet in per day um, over the course of a few weeks? Are we seeing any improvement based on that intervention? So really, uh, and this crosses over to psychologists who do more therapeutic work or more intervention work um, that I, I don't currently offer, but um, this is one way in which the research really dovetails with the clinical practice is at any time you implement an intervention, you've got to set up a little miniature research study to see is that intervention working um, and collect the data to determine if that intervention is working for that specific child. Um, sometimes we're also going to be looking at data collection for quality improvement. So this is something that our hospital does a lot. Um, you know, what are our quality indicators across the hospital system? What interventions do we need to put in place to try to improve those quality uh, indicators? And are we seeing an improvement in, in quality um, across the hospital system? So um, we definitely hear a lot about that in our faculty meetings. 
Um, and then the next one is systems level change. So are we, you know, if we're implementing some sort of an intervention across a system, is it leading to improvement across that system? So I'm a school psychologist by training. I, like I mentioned before, I don't work in a school, um, but systems level change is something that's very important to school psychologists who work in this school. So, you know, if the school as a whole is really showing higher rates of behavioral problems than other schools, maybe we're going to put in place a school-wide behavioral intervention program. So um, one such example would be Positive Behavior Sup Intervention Supports, PBIS. Um, and if we're putting in place a PBIS intervention, then we want to collect systems level data. You know, how many referrals for um, suspension are we getting? Are we able to move the needle from, um, you know, X number of suspensions per week to Y number of suspensions per week through our systems level program. So basically, the, the point of all of this is anytime you implement a program, whether it's at a micro level with one specific individual or whether it's at a macro level across the whole system, we need that those research principles to collect that data and to ensure that our interventions are working. Um, this is particularly important for any time you may want to apply for a grant because if you want to apply for a grant, and it can be a research grant, but it can also be a clinical type of grant, like, hey, we want to get a grant to um, be able to offer family mentorship to our families who have a new autism diagnosis. Well, anytime you go to apply for that grant, that grant is going to want to know, okay, have you done this before? If you've done this before, how has that improved your outcomes? Have you had families following through with more recommendations? Have you had families who um, their children don't require as much um, tr medicine because your uh, family mentorship project is leading to uh, more confidence with behavior management in the parent set, and so then the child doesn't need medicine. Um, so anytime you're going to apply for those grants, even clinical grants, you really need to be able to show the data that shows, okay, yes, I've chosen an evidence-based intervention. We've piloted this program with a few kids. We've seen improvement across these few kids. Now give us a big grant so we can do this across our whole system. Um, and then the grant of course, is going to want you to collect the data to show that your intervention is working after they gave you all that money. So this program evaluation piece, I think, is really important and, and one way in which uh, research really intersects with clinical practice. Okay, the last way is that there is some direct participation in research. Um, different clinicians have varying levels of how much they directly participate in research. I personally um, don't do a lot of direct participation in, in published research, but we do do some things. So um, I actually have uh, one study that I really want to do, um, and I just haven't had time to do it yet. Um, but I would really like to look at um, what we know is that early intervention really benefits children with autism, and the earlier we can get children with autism referred for evaluation, diagnosed with autism, and in, in therapy, the better. And we know that we can reliably diagnose autism at 18 months of age, but the average age of autism uh, diagnosis in the U.S. is around six years of age, so we're not doing a very good job. Um, and so one of the things that I would love to look at is um, that pediatricians, there's two there's two main types of doctor that see doctors that see children in just general, like for your general well child checks. One is pediatricians who um, spend a lot of time learning about development and, and they rotate with our clinic. The other group is family medicine providers who certainly spend some time learning about child development. They never rotate with our clinic. And um, I think that there's just a kind of a training gap there. Obviously, family medicine providers have to know uh, the whole age span. Family medicine serves everybody from birth to, to geriatrics. Um, pediatricians are only responsible for kids and adolescents. So it's hard. Family medicine providers have a lot of demand on their time. But one thing that I'm interested in studying is what's the average age of referral to our clinic and average age of autism diagnosis from uh, pediatric providers versus from family medicine providers? Because anecdotally, I think that the pediatricians are much more likely to catch autism earlier and get it referred to us. So I think that that could be a really cool study. Um, and I think that that study could have some significant impact on family medicine 
medicine training, because if we can then show like, hey, family medicine providers, you know, you guys aren't picking up autism in the same way that the pediatricians are. How can we add additional autism training to the family medicine curriculum for residents so that so that we they can be as heads up as the pedia pediatricians? And that's just my hypothesis. I could be wrong. It could be the exact same age of referral, in which case, okay. Got, glad we learned that. Um, so that's one study that I would love to do. Just haven't had the time to get to that quite yet. Um, another thing that I do participate in is data collection for someone else's study. So uh, clinical trial studies. Um, I'm not actively involved in any of that right now, but in the past um, they've, for instance, are one of the things that the clinic has looked at um, is a part of a study looking at medication side effects um, as a part of a clinical trial. And so um, that's something that uh, I've been kind of tangentially involved in. Um, recruitment is something that we do a lot of. So there are a lot of people who want to study children with disabilities um, from a variety of different angles and studies. And so one place they often come is to our clinic because they know that we work with a ton of uh, children with disabilities. And so they'll say, hey, can you help us recruit four-year-old girls with autism? Or, hey, we want to study high-risk siblings. Can you help us recruit families who have an older child with autism who have a baby between zero and six months of age um, and so we'll try to help find those families and then um, with their permission give their information to the researchers so that they can discuss whether or not that family wants to participate in a research study um, publications this is something that other psychologists who are in academic medical centers like I am do um, my job just tends to be very clinical and so I, at this point I'm not really heavily involved in publications um, I do review for a journal so that is one way that I've kind of kept in touch with my research skills um, is by um, reviewing articles related to autism for one of the school psychology journals and then the last thing, and this ties back into the LEND, which I mentioned towards the beginning, is mentorship of research projects. So even though I'm not necessarily doing a lot of direct research myself in a, in a kind of most classic form, um, I supervise those LEND trainees. So at each year I supervise usually between two and four trainees who each have to complete either a research or a mentor, or sorry, research or leadership project. And so with those research projects, it can really span a variety of different um, types of project, but I'll just give you a couple examples so you have some ideas of what, what we're talking about. Um, so one of my um, research pro um, mentees this year is going to be surveying early education providers, so daycare providers, to better understand their knowledge of serving children with disabilities and kind of trying to identify that um, knowledge gap so that then we can have more evidence to say like, hey, we really need to provide more training to daycare providers on these topics. Um, so that will kind of inform, uh, inform, how do I want to say this, like inform the people who are providing training to daycare providers of what topics related to disability might be really needed. Um, another one of my students is looking at feeding therapy across South Carolina. So um, there's a lot of different ways that feeding therapy can be offered, and it can be offered by a variety of different professionals, speech therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists. And so this student is really looking at where can people access feeding therapy across South Carolina, what type of provider is offering it, and then what models are they using? Because there's a lot of different methods of speech therapy, and some of them have significantly more evidence based than others. So we're just trying to get a handle on what kinds of um, feeding therapy interventions are being delivered across our state, and what are the evidence bases of those feeding therapies. Um, and then one more, just to give you a little bit more of a taste of some projects. So um, I have a, two students working together on a project. One is a law student and the other is um, works for a post-secondary education program for children with disabilities, for, sorry, for adolescents and into adulthood with disabilities. Um, so examples of post-secondary ed would be like Clemson Life or Carolina Life or the Charleston Reach program. Um, with those programs, one of the things that they're trying to understand is, and this one has a little bit of a legal bent to it since the student is a law student, um, but they're trying to understand what um, what the post-secondary education programs in South Carolina are doing 
with regard to vocational rehabilitation. So each state has a vocational rehabilitation that helps with job search, job uh, skills for individuals with disabilities. And we're trying, they're trying to understand from a legal perspective, what is vocational rehabilitation's legal responsibility to individuals with post second in post-secondary rehabilitation? And then what, what kind of services are, is vocational rehab actually delivering to these post-secondary education programs and individuals who are enrolled in them? So um, that one, like I said, has more of a legal bent in terms of what does the law say? And then what is actually actually happening out there in the world and how do these things make sense with one another. So lots of different research um, projects there. So I hope that throughout the course of this presentation, I've been able to sort of paint a picture for you of even if you're thinking to yourself, I really want to be a clinician. I really want to work with kids or I really want to work with adults. I really, you know, I really don't, I don't, I know I need to do research to make it through grad school, but I'm just not sure that I'm really sold on a career in research um, because that's, that's, honestly, very much how I was when I was an undergrad looking at graduate programs. I really hope that throughout this presentation, I've been able to paint um, the importance of research and how it really does intersect with everything that we do in the clinical world um, and how we just have to work collaboratively with the researchers in that scientist practitioner model in order to really make sure that our clinical work is strong and evidence-based, but also that the researchers are doing things that um, actually are useful to, to clinicians and not answering questions that uh, maybe are not directly applicable to the clinical practice. Um, I'm happy if any of you are thinking about a career in school psychology or psychology in general, or if you are considering um, working with individuals with disabilities, no matter what field you're going into, uh, speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am more than happy to talk with you. I'm always eager to, to talk with students who are headed into the field of psychology or headed into a disability related field. Um, if anybody has any interest in participating in LEND in the future and when you're in a graduate program, please um, reach out to me. We'd love to see your applications. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed the opportunity to getting to get to speak with you today and wish you all the best of luck. Bye.